Okay. She has significantly contributed field of closed loop system at multi scale level, and it's a great honor and pleasure to have her. Well, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here today and talk about some of our recent work. Um, so I would say the general theme of my um, lab is to work at the interface of systems and control and statistical inference with neuroscience to develop algorithmic, closed loop algorithmic technologies and brain machine interfaces. Now we built two types of interfaces. First, those that aim to allow the brain to directly control an external device. These are the classical brain machine interfaces, for example, for neuroprosthetics. But what I'm gonna talk about today mainly is uh, a second generation of brain machine interfaces that actually aim to do kind of the opposite and control the state of the brain itself. And on that front, what I'll talk about is our work on developing closed loop systems using electrical stimulation to control the brain state in neuropsychiatric disorders. So as, as many of you may know, neuropsychiatric disorders are pretty prevalent in the population and pretty debilitating. And unfortunately, a large proportion of these patients do not respond to any medication or psychotherapy. For example, for major depression, there's only, there's, there's five million patients who are treatment resistant just in the US alone. So the question is, what do we do for these patients? And there's actually been great seminal work showing that if we electrically stimulate an appropriate region of the brain, such as subcolossal cingulate white matter, depression symptoms may be alleviated. But the problem has been that these have not been universally effective in all individuals, um, so which leaves the question of why and how, how can we improve efficacy. So when we started thinking about this problem, the idea was, well, what if instead of having a stimulation device that turns on and stays on continuously, we try to guide how we stimulate by the very neural activity that we're trying to control and basically close the loop. Now, while closed loop stimulation has not been demonstrated for neuropsychiatric disorders, it's actually been tried in other neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease. And here, when people talk about closed loop, usually what they mean is an on-off control scheme whereby you kind of come up with a biomarker for your disease symptoms. For example, the beta amplitude on an STN electrode in Parkinson. You set a threshold on it, and depending on whether you're above or below it, you turn your stimulation on and off. So why is this difficult in the case of neuropsychiatric disorders? So first of all, we know that mental state representations are pretty distributed across a wide um, multi-region brain network. So maybe taking a biomarker approach, like a local biomarker approach, is not the best way to go around it, and we may need to resort to a decoding approach to integrate information across this network. The second problem is that these representation and symptoms are pretty dynamic and actually exhibit inter and intrasubject variability. So maybe we need to actually resort to model-based control approaches by which we model these very dynamics as opposed to just turning stimulation on and off and use these models to guide how we stimulate in real time. So what do I exactly mean by a model? So I mean a model that would tell us not only how neural activity evolves in time, so spontaneous dynamics, but also how stimulation changes neural activity, so input-driven dynamics, and then how these dynamics relate to the mental state or the brain state. So if we can build such a model, then we have a full end-to-end -end model between stimulation and the mental state through neural activity, and I would argue we can use it to build better treatments for neuropsychiatric disorders. But also importantly, something I'm not going to focus on in this talk, we can use it as a new scientific tool to validate the very models and the functional organization of the networks that we are trying to control. All right, so what is the closed loop system that we envision? So we envision a closed loop system that would take the neural recordings, have a desired level of mood in mind in the case of major depression, and based on that, adjust these amplitude and frequency of the simulation pulse range. The controller that we want to build consists of two components. First as a decoder that would take the neural activity and from that estimate in real time how somebody's mood is changing. And then a feedback controller that would take that as feedback to adjust the simulation. But the first thing we need in order to build a decoder is an encoding model that tells us, okay, how are these mood variations even represented in neural dynamics? 
But that's not enough, because even if I can see your mood variations perfectly, I still have no clue how to stimulate the brain to change it. So what we need in addition to that is an input output model that would tell us, okay, how is stimulation changing neural activity and therefore mood? And if we have both of these models, maybe we can put them together and come up with a control strategy. So of course this is a very challenging problem. When we started working on this problem, in particular decoding of mood had not been demonstrated. And this is difficult uh, for two main reasons. The first reason is what I alluded to before, that these mental state representations are distributed across a multi-region brain network. And unfortunately, we don't understand the functional organization of these networks very well. So that means you don't even know where to go and listen to in order to decode mood. What further makes this problem challenging is that mood is very difficult to measure. For example, unlike movements that people who build motor B BCIs in this audience are aware, you can measure movements continuously uh, and accurately, but how are we gonna measure mood? Our best surrogate is to actually give people a questionnaire and just basically ask them, well, how do you feel right now? And you can do this a couple times a day. So that means you have very sparse measurements of the very mood variations you're trying to model. So you have this distributed network, very high dimensional neural feature space that you need to model with sparse training data and that's a machine learning challenge. So the question we started with was, well, can we even decode mood variations using large scale activity? And if we can, what are the brain networks that are essential for this decoding? So we actually showed last year that indeed it's possible to decode mood variations using intracranial human brain activity. This is work by two of my students, Omid Sani and Yu Yang, and in collaboration with Eddie Chang, who's a neurosurgeon at UCSF. And the way we went about solving this was we said, okay, well, if it's a distributed representation, first step is let's take distributed recordings. So in epilepsy subjects, so while they were being monitored in the hospital, we, we could actually uh, obtain distributed multi-region recordings uh, using ECOG arrays. And then while they were in the hospital across multiple days, these recordings were 24 seven, we could actually intermittently measure their mood using a questionnaire that's called the immediate mood scaler. So basically it's an iPad based questionnaire with 22 questions. In each question, you're asked to rate your mood on a scale, for example, uh, depressed to happy, click one of these buttons and tell me how you feel right now. So the closer to the left you press, the more depressed you are, the closer to the right, the happier you are. So we sum up all of these numbers and we get one measure, aggregate measure, which is our operational definition of mood. And this has been validated actually against traditional measures. So this, is, this gives us our data set. So we have multi-day, continuous, 24-7 network recordings on the neural space, but maybe two IMS points a day on the mood measurement space. So there, there are six days, maybe 12 data points. And with that, we want to build an encoding model that tells us how mood variations are represented in neural dynamics. So the first idea we had to solve this problem was, well, if it's a high dimensional feature space, let's do dimensionality reduction. Let's try to represent neurodynamics in terms of a small number of uh, latent variables, and then just relate those small number of latent variables to our mood measurements to enable kind of generalizable modeling. And how do we do dimensionality reduction? So the first intuition we had was, well, if it's a distributed representation, there's probably redundancy in the network. So what if instead of trying to model everything, which is not possible, we try to find and identify the smallest possible network size that's good enough for decoding and just focusing, focus on modeling that. So we developed a method uh, we call progressive region selection that starts from small networks and grows the network size only as needed to achieve a decoding. Further, even within these small networks, what we needed to do was to describe the dynamics and also do more dimensionality reduction. So we modeled the neural feature within these smaller networks using a latent state space model. So here, neural features are in purple, basically, and you're describing them in terms of a much lower dimensional latent state X, and the dynamics are described in terms of X, so how it moves from time T minus one to time T. So together what this gives you is a small number of predictors 
uh, for neural dynamics, and then you can only relate those small number of predictors to your sparse mood measurements and hope that you can do generalizable modeling. All right, so once you have the encoding model, the decoder is just basically a common filter. You estimate the latent state and a regression, then you predict mood. The question is, does this even work? Uh, so we tested this in seven patients. Uh, I'm showing you uh, the decoded mood versus the measured mood. So the closer to the 45 degree line, the better. And you can see that we're doing a good job in terms of, uh, in terms of tracking their mood variations. But what was more important to us was that in every single individual, we could do this um, tracking, opening the door and the, uh, to, to the possibility of personalized, um, personalized treatments. OK, so this is great. But what were the networks that were important for decoding? So we found actually that our decoder largely recruited the limbic networks. And we confirmed this with three searches. First, we said, let's just do our modeling within the limbic regions and then do it using all electrodes. And what we found was that consistent networks were selected in every patient in the limbic regions, showing kind of the robustness of the method. Second, without these regions, decoding failed. So this showed the biological consistency with neuroimaging studies that show limbic regions are critical in emotional processing. And interestingly, despite the fact that the decoder is trained in a personalized manner and there are a lot of regions it can select, uh, we found that in 60% of our subjects, the decoder picked the orbital frontal cortex as the most predictive site. And this is interesting because in an independent study in collaboration with Eddie, we've been trying to identify where to stimulate in the brain to alleviate mood symptom. And what we've found is that actually orbital frontal stimulation alleviate mood symptoms more consistently than other regions that we've tried. And this kind of the decoding work is modeling. It's completely independent. This is stimulation, try on error based study. And the fact that they converge on the same region provides some evidence for the critical role of OFC in this mood regulation network. All right, great. So what I've shown you so far is that we can get the feedback signal. We can get a decoding of mood. But as I mentioned, the next thing we need is to know well, how is simulation going to change neural activity and therefore mood. So how do we build this input output model? So we've developed a system identification framework to do, uh, to do uh, that, uh, and we published it last year. So the idea is we want a model of this box. And there's biophysical models that try to do actually this, meaning how simulation changes neural activity. The problem with biophysical models, though, is that they're disease specific. So for example, they're for basal ganglia cortical dynamics in Parkinson's disease. They're complex and typically population level, so their parameters are not easily fit to an individual's data. So they may not easily generalize to closed loop control. There's also models based on experimental data, but they usually focus on localized kind of cortical regions or cortical columns. What makes it hard for, for our case is that we need to describe the response across a large-scale multi-region network. We need to do it in every individual. We need to do it in response to a time-varying simulation. And that's, that's what makes the problem challenging. So our goal was to develop a data-driven identification framework to do this and test it in, in vivo. So the first thing was, OK, what, what is a data-driven model structure? So we wanted, to, wanted it to have two properties. First, it, it needed to be predictive, because we wanted to predictive control. Second, it had to be amenable to designing a tractable controller. So we therefore settled on the kind of the same linear latent state space model that we use for mood decoding. But what we needed to do extra was to uh, take into account the effect of stimulation. And our hypothesis was that the effect of stimulation would likely be reflected in this latent state and through that in neural activity and in mood. And the question, major question was, well, how do we even fit the parameters of this model? Now, because it's data-driven, we, we have to actually collect some informative data to do this. So we have to simulate the brain, collect the data set, and fit the model parameters. But the question is, how? 
How do we simulate the brain? How do we collect informative data sets? And indeed, for those of you who are familiar with system identification theory, what you want to do is usually you want to apply inputs that excite the system you're trying to identify, uh, for example, across all frequency bands. And usually what you want to do is to use these kind of white spectrum inputs, almost like white noise. But what does that mean in terms of brain stimulation, where people use these biphasic periodic pulse strings that are far from being white? So our key idea there was it's really the parameters of these pulse strings that are the inputs, because they're the ones that drive clinical outcomes, such as frequency and amplitude. So what we need to do is to design a new waveform that's white spectrum in the parameter space. So this is the waveform we designed. We started with the same biphasic pulse that clinicians are com comfortable with. And then we said, let's change its amplitude and frequency stochastically in time according to a binary noise sequence. So a binary noise sequence can take only two values. And at each point, you flip a coin with 50% probability you switch. With 50% probability, you stay at the same level. So we create a binary noise for the amplitude and frequency independently, and we modulate this pulse. And we get what we call a binary noise modulated electrical stimulation pattern. This is white spectrum. It's clinically safe because you're using the same charge balance pulses. And it's flexible. You can use any kind of pulse shape you like. Um, in, in our publication, we just did numerical simulations. And in numerical simulations, we showed that well, this waveform is critical in system ID. But of course, the main question is, does this even work for describing the brain response? So we started a collaboration about uh, two years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, with Bijan Pesaron's lab at NYU to test this idea in non-human primate experiments. So his setup allowed us to stimulate at one region while recording the response across multiple brain regions using local field potentials. And so we basically applied our binary noise. You did artifact removal. We uh, collected the spectral powers. We fitted our model. And then we asked the question, can this model predict how neural activity changes in response to a change in stimulation parameters? And the way we evaluated this was using forward prediction. So we said the model can only at each time use the past input, so the past stimulation, to predict what the current output or neural activity is. And this is uh, an example prediction of the model. So you're seeing the input-driven response in gray and our model predictions in orange. And you can see that we can actually track these variations. This is a closer uh, view of the feature and the prediction. And this result held across multiple animals and multiple stimulation sites. So this is great. But the question next was, was this dynamical model even necessary to get this prediction? What are the dynamical characteristics? Could I have used just a simpler model, for example? So if you think about a dynamical model, right, in the most general case, so, so the dynamics are mainly summarized in this A matrix, right, which tells you how you go from time t minus 1 to time t. And in particular, in the most general case, the eigenvalues of this matrix are complex conjugate numbers. And what they imply is that for, to get the current output, you weigh the past input according to weights that both oscillate into the past and decay into the past. So you can build a special cases of this. Regression is a special case of this, where your current output is just a function of your current input, your current stimulation. So how does that work? Much worse. Let's say I build a model that just smooths, smooths out my past input. How does that work? Much worse. What if I get rid of oscillations and just smooth out my past according to a decaying weight? Much worse. So what this showed us was that it, indeed the response had both oscillatory and decaying dynamics. And this general model was necessary to predict it. The other interesting observation we had was that the response was actually pretty distributed across the brain regions and frequency bands. But the strength of modulation was variable across the, the network nodes. And the question was why? So our hypothesis was that it, this likely has something to do with the function of connectivity between the stimulation node and the target node. So we went ahead and tested this hypothesis by collecting at-rest data without any stimulation, computed the measure of functional connectivity, and we said, well, does that correlate with the strength of stimulation that we see at these target nodes? And indeed, it did. 
So basically, this tells us that functional connectivity at rest actually explained the variability that we saw in modulation strength. And this is interesting because it provides us, in a way, with an independent validation of our input output modeling. Because in one case, you have no simulation. It's just address data, functional connectivity. And that result matches up with the results we get with our input output model during stimulation. All right, uh, we've also actually done this in human experiments in collaboration with Eddie using ECOG arrays. I'm not gonna go into the details of that, uh, but the results are very similar in terms of how, how good we can predict and so on. All right, great. So we can get the feedback signal. We have the input output model. How do we put them together to build a controller? So here I'm just gonna give you an intuition. Um, so basically the idea is that if you have the input output model, then you know how a change in stimulation changes neural activity. If you have the decoder, then you can know how a change in neural activity translates to a change in mood. So together, if you can combine these two models, you have a direct transfer function from stimulation to mood through neural activity, and you can use it to build a predictive controller. That's something we're doing right now, so I'm not gonna go into the details of this for the interest of time. Okay, so before I end, I just wanna give you a teaser on the extensions of these models that we're doing in the lab. And the main idea here is how do we dissociate neural dynamics that are related to the behavior or function that you're trying to decode and control? So what do I exactly mean by that? So if you think about these latent states that I've been talking about so far, what we were trying to do is to find latent states that describe our neural recordings. And then we're trying to relate it to a given behavior. So here, as an example, I'm showing you movements. Let's say you're interested in movements, you want to study movements. The issue is that these brain states and these neural recordings are not just representing your movements. So if I'm moving my hand, my neural record is not just representing my movement. It's representing, well, how nervous I am right now talking to you, what my emotions are, how thirsty I am, how hungry I am. So they're actually what we're interested in is to find the dynamics in neural activity that are shared with the dynamics in behavior rather than everything. And unfortunately, there's no algorithm that can give us this shared dynamic right now. So current methods are all unsupervised. So they ignore behavior. They build the, late, the dynamical model and get the latent state. And what happens is they basically get those red parts, which are behaviorally irrelevant. And that can potentially mask or confound the shared part, which is what we're after. So can we develop an algorithm that directly extracts this? And the answer is yes. And we developed this algorithm and we recently put it on by archive, so I'm not gonna go into the details of it. You can look at that uh, paper if you're interested. But the basic idea is that now we have a learning algorithm that can dissociate this latent state into two sections, one behaviorally relevant, one irrelevant. And it's based on the idea of projection of future behavior into past neural activity to find a subspace in neural dynamics that's predictive of future behavior. But I'm not gonna go into the details of it for the interest of time. What I'll show you is what we can do with it. So we've tested this in this task where monkeys are performing this naturalistic reach and grasp movements. So it's a very rich task. They're moving in 3D space. And a big question in neuroscience is what is the dimension of behaviorally relevant dynamics, neural dynamics? What's the dimension of this manifold? So we said, okay, let's use our algorithm, preferential subspace identification, or PSID, and unsupervised methods, and see what we find in terms of dimension. And the dimension that you find is the dimension at which your decoding saturates. So interestingly, what we find is that PSID reveals that the dimension of behaviorally rele relevant dynamics are markedly lower than what you would conclude if you use these unsupervised methods. So four versus 12 to 30. Not only that, with just four dimensions, we can do much better decoding than a much higher dimensional model than the other methods identify. So this, of course, scientifically is very important, but I would say from an engineering perspective, this tells you that you can build much, much less complex models 
orders of magnitude less training data to do decoding and control in a brain machine interface systems. And this, this result kind of extended to all of the joint angles and all of the brain regions that we looked at within uh, this task. All right, so to summarize, toward building these model-based controllers of brain states, what I've shown you is a demonstration of personalized mood decoding, an input output modeling framework to specify the effect of simulation, and finally, a novel method to dissociate behaviorally relevant neural dynamics that you're interested in decoding and controlling. And we're hoping that working at the interface of stochastic control and neuroscience and system ID, we can basically build this next generation of treatments for neuropsychiatric disorders and beyond. So thank you, and with that, I'll take any questions. I should thank my lab, of course, sorry. <laughs> So it's really surprising how well your linear decoder did, since we know the brain is highly nonlinear. But I wonder if you use a nonlinear decoder, you could do even better, like a uh, variational autoencoder to get the latent variables out. Yeah, that, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, so we've actually tried. We've actually compared these linear state space models in the case of ECOG to nonlinear uh, dynamical models, such as using like radial basis function expansions, and they don't do better. And we've also compared, uh, so in this task that I showed you, we've co uh, compared to other encoders as well, and PSID does better. The, 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 the difference is that we are really trying to dissociate behaviorally relevant dynamics. If you go nonlinear, you're not dissociating, you're just trying to use nonlinearity to better model the dynamics. And we find that that doesn't uh, give you that boost that you get by just trying to dissociate. So we've tried, we haven't seen, at least for LFPs and ECOG, we haven't seen any difference. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. I hope the study is very interesting. Um, I, was, I was, personally, I was working with system identification by correlating the EMG and EEG. And I, I realized, like, using black box modeling was very, pretty difficult. And there's, I have one question, like what's the parameter that you're collecting? If you're only changing the amplitude and frequency, both they're related to the power spectral density. How do you, um, because they, they should be um, um, effective for like, there, there's an influence of both the amplitude and frequency to the neural network. So how, how do you control that to, to, to modulate the, the feedback control? Oh, so, so, so we are identifying the effect of each of these um, uh, according to our linear models. So we are trying to see how each of them are changing the neural network, and that's what the identification uh, tells us. If there are nonlinear interaction, if that's what you mean, if there, for example, nonlinear interactions between them, we can't capture those. But, but what we've seen is that using these linear models that try to dissociate the effect of two and model both of these, their effect, we can do good prediction. Um, but so remember, these are, these are parameters we control, right? These are our parameters, and we can, have, uh, we can adjust them according to the model we identify. So we have control over them in building the system. Okay. Any other questions? Good. Okay. Very nice work. Thank you. Um, now, so you have this neural decoder, right? You can detect, I guess, moods. Yeah. And then you have the other control system, right, where you can generate certain brain states. Um, but um, what would, how can you determine that this would indeed, that you close the loop? Because brain states are very high dimensional, and, and so um, your observations are limited. So you can elicit a certain um, brain state, or think that you have a certain brain state, but, but actually it, 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 it may, may well be different, right? Because uh, you have a very reduced uh, dimensionality. Yes, so, so that, that's what I was trying to get at with the, the, the last piece, which, which, which tried to dissociate what elements of the brain state is related to a behavior or function of interest that you're trying to control. Of course, our brain is doing a ton of stuff. We are feeling, we're talking, we're moving. 
And if you want to just unsup, that's my whole point. If you want to unsupervise identify all of the dynamics that are going on in neural activity, you're going to get a high dimensional space. But actually, what I'm showing you is that even for this very naturalistic complex movement, if you dissociate what part of dynamics are related to that, they're not that high dimensional. It was four dimensional. And that four dimensional could actually describe it pretty well. So if we can algorithms, uh, can develop algorithms that dissociate dynamics that we're interested in controlling, it might be actually that the manifold is not that high dimensional, and therefore we can build robust controllers and decoders. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Wonderful.